Hi, everybody. I'm Mr. Kevin. I have a master's degree in violin performance from Rice University, and I've been teaching for several years now. So I want to share with you the beginner lesson that I've taught many times. For some of you, this may be your first time hearing this information. And for others of you, this may be a review of the first lesson that you already had. So the first thing I want to share with you is the different parts of the violin, since we need to know the names of things to know how to talk about violin. So I'm going to share a picture. And here it is. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the bridge. The bridge is an interesting part of the violin, and we can see it here in this cross section. Now my strings are stretched over the bridge, and so when the strings vibrate, those vibrations are picked up by the bridge. And the bridge transfers those vi vibrations through its little feet here into the top of the instrument. Then once the vibrations are in the top of the instrument, there's another piece on the inside of your violin that you can probably see if you look in through the rightmost F hole, and that is the sound post. So this little stick picks up the vibrations from the bridge and transfers them into the back of the instrument. And now you can see that as soon as I've begun to play a string, now the whole instrument is vibrating thanks to these parts. The next thing I wanna show you is the fingerboard. And that is this long black piece of wood running up the middle of the instrument. That is where I put my fingers when I play. So a fingerboard is a good name for it. At the very top of the fingerboard, we have the nut, which is another bump that the strings stretch over. This is kind of like the end point for our strings. And this whole part here, that you can see <clears throat> running from the scroll to the violin is called the neck. That's because it looks like a neck with shoulders. So when we line up our left hand to play the instrument, we are gonna put it on either side of the neck close to the nut. At the top here, we have what are called tuning pegs. They're used to adjust the strings to the right tension so that they're playing the right notes. You can adjust the tuning pegs by turning them away from you to make them tighter or toward you to make them looser. Although I don't recommend doing this on your own, it's best to have your teacher do this for you. Finally, the top part of the instrument right here is called, let me move my bar out of the way here. This is called the scroll because it looks like a rolled up piece of paper. At the bottom of the instrument, we have what's called the tailpiece. And here you can find your fine tuners. The fine tuners are like the tuning pegs, but they don't make such big adjustments. The fine tuners only make very small adjustments to the notes the strings play. You might have four of them, but professional instrument models have only one. It's better to have four when you're beginning so that you can make small adjustments to all the strings but some people say it affects the sound and that's why the professional models often just have the one. Here we also have the chin rest. It's called the chin rest because it's where I put my chin when I play. And there's one other part that I think is important to show you and that is this part. This is called the shoulder rest. And most violins don't come with a shoulder rest, but it's often a good idea to have one, especially if you have a long neck. I have a very long neck and you can see there's all this empty space between where my chin contacts the chin rest and my shoulder. So I wanna fill in that empty space using a device like this. You may also be able to find a shoulder sponge or a shoulder pad, and that will work better for people with shorter necks. But as you can see, now all of that empty space is supported by the shoulder rest. Finally, we have to talk about the names of the strings. We call the strings names based on the letter of the note that they play. So as you can see, my strings are in order from thickest to thinnest. Let's zoom in on that. So, the thickest string makes the lowest sounds and it is called the G string. Then the strings go up, 
making higher and higher sounds as we go from right to left here. The next highest string is called the D string. The next one is the A string. And the next one is the E string. And that is our highest string. So G, D, A, E. I think it makes a lot of sense that the thinnest string should make the highest sound and the thickest string should make the lowest sound. Now, when you want to quiz yourself on the string names, you can do all kinds of different things, such as writing out a sequence of G's and D's and A's and E's and trying to pluck the different strings that you wrote down. So say I wrote A, D, E, A, then I would just take my finger and pluck each string. A, D, E, A. So that's a good way to practice your string names. The next thing I like to teach is the bow hold. And to understand our bow hold, we need to know about the frog, which is this part of the bow, and the tip, which is this part of the bow. There's one other part of the bow that's important, and that is the screw. This is an actual screw that is used to tighten or loosen the hair. So as I turn it to the left, you can see that my hair is getting looser. And as I turn it to the right, you can see that my hair is getting tighter. I want it to be about finger width in tightness, okay? So it's very important that when we learn to hold the bow, we follow each step really carefully because if I have a bad bow hold, it's gonna affect my sound. My sound will be quite scratchy, right? But if I have a good bow hold, my sound will be much better, okay? So the first step to having a great bow hold is to take your right hand and lay it very heavily on top of the bow stick above the frog. This is important because it's teaching me to relax the weight of my arm into the top of the bow. If everything was just floating here above the bow, I wouldn't be able to make any sound. But when I relax the weight of my hand into the bow, then I get a sound. So the first step is to lay your hand heavily on top of the bow stick. Next, we are gonna take our pinky and we're going to curve it and put it just above this dot on the frog. If you don't have a dot on your frog, that is okay. You can just put it above approximately the center of the frog. And finally, the third step is to put our thumb curved right around where this metal bracket is. Now, it's important that both my pinky and my thumb be curved because that affects the quality of the sound. If you're an adult beginner, then what you might try is going straight to putting your thumb here. This is a more advanced bow hold. So if you wanna try the advanced bow hold, you'll put your thumb right in this brown space that begins right before the start of the frog. So I'm not putting it in the frog like this, I'm putting it in this brown space. And you can see that my thumb is curved, okay? So this is the advanced bow hold and this is the beginner bow hold. But whichever one you do, you can see that my hand has this nice C shape. If it was shaped like this, then I'm probably going to get a very crunchy sound. But this C shape is very good, and that's going to give us the best sound. So as a quick review, the three steps are lay your hand heavy on top, curve your pinky, and put it right above the dot and curve your thumb and put it on this metal bracket. Once we have the bow hold, we wanna just make sure that our fingers are nice and neatly organized. A really common mistake is to have the fingers spread out like this and all curled up and scrunched. I keep my fingers very nicely packed together and you'll notice that my two middle fingers are just dangling their feet off the edge of the bow. So I don't, uh, curl and scrunch them like this so that they're squeezing the bow. I keep their feet 
dangling just like this. Now there's several exercises that we do in the first lesson to practice our bow hold. So once we find the bow hold, we can turn it straight up and down just like this. And here's some of the exercises that I'll have students do. I will say, let's stir the soup. You can do something like this. And then let's stir the soup the other way. Each time we pause after one of these exercises, we're gonna to check to see that our pinky is still curved and that our thumb is still curved. And the whole point of these exercises is to train the hand to have a curved thumb and a curved pinky through all of these different motions. Okay, let's practice blasting off from the moon and then landing safely on earth. And let's also practice windshield wipers. This one is the trickiest one because it puts a lot of pressure on the pinky finger, especially in this position. Then I like to teach my students in the first lesson, up bow and down bow. These are the two bow directions that we use when we play the violin. Up, down. And we can practice some basic rhythms using up bow and down bow. So for instance, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, or strawberry, 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 or alligator, alligator, alligator. So you can try some of these. I recommend spending the first week simply practicing exercises like this because you're training your hand to keep this shape and to actually balance this weight that is in the bow. You notice that as I swing it around, you can see the bow has some weight to it, especially in the frock. So you're training your hand to have structure and to balance that weight. The next thing I want to talk about is the violin hold and proper violin posture. So when we start out, we want to be in what's called rest position. The way that I found this position was I took my violin with my left hand and I tucked it under my right arm. Notice how the bridge is facing away from me, not facing inward like this. This is a mistake and can actually break your instrument. So I have the bridge facing outward. This is a nice way to hold the violin because it lets me use my left hand to access the neck very easily. So the steps for having a great violin hold is to start in rest position. Then I'm gonna take my left hand and I'm just gonna wrap it around the neck, thumb around this way. And I'm just gonna slide my left hand up and down the neck of the instrument to make sure that my hold is nice and loose and comfortable. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach my hand around the neck and I'm gonna hold it straight up like the Statue of Liberty, just like this. You see that my arm is just extending very naturally out of my shoulder socket, right? The most important step to finding a great violin hold is that we are going to bring the instrument to our head without twisting. We don't even want to look our head at the instrument at first. We wanna keep our head just natural like we were having a conversation with somebody and bring the violin to that. So avoid the temptation of looking. Let's bring it this way and have the violin go straight under our chin here. Okay, so you notice my head is still pointed forward. I'm not looking at the violin like this. This is a big pain in the neck if you don't keep track of what you're doing with your neck. So you notice that the way I'm holding my violin, it's very flat relative to the ground. It's like a table. That allows me to place the bow on the violin and be relaxed. If, for instance, I had my posture like this, the bow is gonna to tend to slide. Same thing if I'm overly straight, same problem, right? So we wanna have the violin nice and flat to create kind of a playing surface. It's like if you were gonna build a house of cards, you wouldn't wanna build one on a table that's all tilted. You would wanna build one on a flat table that gives you support, right? And in many ways, the violin does support the bow from underneath. Once you've found your violin hold, you can take your left hand and just rest it right here. As long as you don't need to use your left fingers, this is a great place to put your hand. 
So let's go over the steps one more time. We are going to start in rest position. We are going to slide our left hand along the neck of the instrument until we feel comfortable. Then we're going to grab the violin and stand like the Statue of Liberty. And finally, we bring the violin to our chin without looking or twisting our head. You see how I brought the violin to me. And now the real gold standard is if you can hold your violin just with your neck and your head. I'm not gripping down really hard. I'm just using my head to balance. And then we can simply put our hand right here on the bout. The last thing that I wanna to share today is the different playing motions that our arm makes when we're playing with the bow. Remember, we play with the bow in the right hand and the violin in the left hand. Doesn't matter whether you're left-handed or right-handed, it's always the same. So I like to tell a story about Goldilocks, like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Goldilocks was noticing that her arm had three joints in it. The shoulder joint, the elbow joint, and the wrist. And she wanted to figure out which one was the best for playing violin. So first she tried the shoulder joint. And she thought, that sounds terrible. It's too big of a motion. And so it makes my bow go really crazy. That joint's just too big. So then she used her wrist. And she said, wow, that sounds really scratchy. That means that joint is too small. Then she tried her elbow. And she saw that the elbow was just right. So this is a really important point that we should mainly use our elbow joint when we play. The most common beginner mistakes are to use the shoulder, which results in something completely out of control or to use the wrist, which results in something really slow and crunchy. So we use the elbow joint. Now, a lot of people find it hard to exclusively open and close from the elbow joint. So I recommend this exercise. Pretend like you have a violin coming out from your left side here and hold your arm up as if you were going to draw the bow along the strings. Then you can take your left hand and put it here in the crook of your arm. And that will prevent you from using your shoulder. And then you just practice opening and closing from your elbow. And you see that I'm getting a very concentrated motion right here from my elbow. This is exactly the motion that we want for many of the beginner bow strokes. Okay, so that is the playing motion. If you wanna play on one string, it works great. However, there's one other motion that we're gonna to need to really take advantage of the full range of the violin. And that is the string crossing motion. You notice that when I open and close from my elbow, it just plays one string. What if I wanna play a different string? Well, in order to figure this out, I wanna show you that when I place my bow in the middle of the bow like this on the string, you can kind of see that it forms a square from my bow, my forearm, my upper arm, and this imaginary line that the instrument follows. So I have this square. And the best way to change strings when we're first beginning is to raise and lower this square. Notice how I'm kind of leading the motion from my elbow and my elbow is kind of bringing the bow with it. One way to know if you're doing this correctly is that the bow and your upper arm should always move together. So this is not right. This is not right because the bow is not moving with it, but this is right because they're moving together. So a really important exercise that you can use to practice this 
is can you change all the way from the G string to the E string without making any scratching noises? All you can hear is the bow touching the different strings. So if you can do that, that means you have really good control over this motion. The first song that I usually teach is called the open string song. And it's all about learning to separate the playing motion from the string crossing motion. So I'll play it for you now. just now, I was making sure that I played the string using my elbow joint, but then I changed strings leading with my square. Play, change strings, play, change strings. So I'm being very, very careful to separate the playing motion from the string crossing motion. The most common problem that people run into is they do both at the same time. And so I don't hear each string individually. I get a kind of a mess of different strings. And if you're having a hard time doing this smoothly, take it even slower. Play, change strings, play. until you get used to those two different motions. Once you have them separated, you're actually set up to use the bow really well on multiple different songs. So I hope this lesson was useful for you. For anybody who's uh, hoping to remember their first lesson, I hope this jogged your memory. And for anybody who has uh, questions, please leave questions in the comments because it'll help me to improve these videos in the future. Thank you, everybody.